I hope, uh, if I may, encourage you as we enter the month of December and we begin the celebration of Advent that you will take that seriously. I think we have to work hard, and we've talked about this as a church for a long time, to become a counterculture. And I think we know what that means in regard to the culture at large and the world, to be a counterculture, to live differently, to have different morals and values, even a different king and a kingdom that directs how we live. One of the ways that we are discipled most neutrally that we don't even realize is the difference between the secular or civil calendar and the church calendar. And Advent is a beautiful way to remind ourselves that the purpose and meaning of Christmas is very different than it may be celebrated by a lot of people in the world today and in our culture. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy all the Christmassy cultural things, right? Or watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I think I watched it every year as a kid. I'm assuming they still show that, although my kids would laugh at the technology now. What kind of graphics are those, Dad? Be quiet. But the reality is, Advent is a wonderful way to remind ourselves about the reason and the meaning of Christmas. And every year we encourage you to do this as a church. We encourage you to participate not just in Advent on Sunday mornings, which we do. We provide this, this reading guide that's already been plugged before that Casey Ellers and Carl Rudy worked on and put together for us. So I encourage you as individuals, as families, with your children, to make Advent part of your own home culture, not just your church culture. But this year is unique because actually Advent requires four, or excuse me, five services or five candles with the last middle candle being lit on Christmas Eve, that also happens to be a Sunday. You can imagine, right? you've already come Sunday morning on December 24th to church. It'd be really to say, we've already checked, we already got that Sunday done. But I just want to encourage you, literally in the season of Advent, to come not only as part of the Lord's Day regular gathering on Sunday morning, but on Christmas Eve to come as well and worship with your church family just to make that part of your own practice as a Christian, your practice as a family, I think is significant. So if I could encourage you in that way, I want to. We, we just finished the book of James and we are going to start in January, go back into Samuel and begin the book of 2 Samuel. We took a break from the Old Testament and worked through James for a few months, and we're going to jump back into 2 Samuel. But now, in this month of December, we've got a communion Sunday coming up next week. We've got a Christmas message on December 24th. And there were two Sundays that I didn't necessarily want to start something brand new in a series that got pauses. And I kind of wanted to take two Sundays, today being the first, to just give you some encouragement from our Lord. To tell you maybe some of the most important things that just come to mind that I think would fit our local body and, and maybe many of you. And one is one that Vera so beautifully introduced in her kids' talk, even having us cite together John 3.16. It's one of the most important truths in Scripture. It probably is, maybe I shouldn't even say probably, it may simply be the most important thing you can ever hear. It is hard to even grasp, if we're being honest, the simple three-word statement that God loves you. God loves you. And now while love, as Vera rightly said, is all over the place and defined in a whole lot of different ways in our culture, it is a significant message of Scripture. God's intentions toward you. The very reason he sent his son into the world, the very reason he sent his son to the cross is because he loves you. I thought it was fitting, not just during Advent season, but just as disciples, or maybe even some of you sitting here or in the service to come who do not yet fully commit your life to Christ. You're still kind of asking some big questions about this thing called Christianity. I would want to tell you what the Bible makes clear is a primary theme, a primary truth that is for you to receive. God loves you. Our children need to learn that. Our most senior saints need to hear that. 
for the thousandth time. And we need to live out this reality, as our text today will say. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, we will read verses 7 through 12. It is a beautiful structure. It is, the Bible loves to do. It begins with a theme and ends with a theme. And in the center, like a good Oreo, it's got all the important stuff about God's love. It begins and ends with our love for one another, but the source of that, the engine, the motor of that is God's love for us. I'm going to read 1 John 4, 7 to 12. I'm going to pray and then we'll jump in. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Let's pray. Fathers, we hear this message this morning, which comes not just from this one text, but from all of Scripture, Old and New Testament. Help us to understand who you are and how you are love and how your love has been made manifest for us and in us. Father, I pray that this morning every man, every woman, every child in this room would be clearly understanding that God loves them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Vera already said at four points, it's not fair she reads my notes beforehand, to be honest with you. I do email them to her. But the first and four things I want to say is this, and I think this is actually really important when we think about how God is love as a statement there in verse 8, at the end of verse 8, gives us a whole ton of spectacles to see the world in which we live and the life that we live. Are dealing with. When the Bible says God is love, it is explaining everything God does to us and for us. Like when the Bible says God is love, it's explaining everything God does, God allows, God permits, God directs, and God ordains for us. And we have to define, though, love carefully. We have to define it according to Scripture. Love is not merely emotions, even if emotions are involved in the act of loving. Love is also not just a generic way, like we speak in our culture, of liking something. Like, I love pizza, or I love some sports team, or I love this new dress. That's how we speak all the time, but that's not how the Bible defines love. It's not just kind of, a, kind of an amped up liking, or, or, or a hyperbolic way of saying you like something. We use love that way, but when it is part of God's character, again, verse 8, the end of 8, God is love. That's an important statement. It's not just something he does, it's something he is. So hear that. It's not just what he does, like he can turn it on and off. It's actually part of his very character. It's part of his person. When it is part of God's character, it is a purified and perfect love. God is love. That is so important for us to know. And pastorally, it tells us several things. Scripture wants us to know that love is a core virtue of God. And let me explain pastorally what that means. Let me give you a few areas. Because God is love, the good things we experience are always from his benevolence and his generosity. All good things come from above. So every single thing that you probably can't even sit and 
count or quantify every single good thing is from God. And the Christian learns to worship literally 24-7 because you're blown away by the goodness of God. Because when the sun comes up and you can see and it warms your body and it helps the plants grow and it does a ton of other things that this non-scientist wouldn't even know, all of that is because of God's benevolence toward us. Because he could have had to give light but not heat in some way, or heat but not light, or help with food to grow. But somehow all those things come from a creator who just loves his creatures and cares for his creation. And you can just see a sunset beyond the beauty of it and say, God, you are so generous to us. So to be able to look at the world and every good thing, every, every good sa- sip of cocoa, every cuddle with a grandchild, every special moment with a teenager, every common grace gift of a car that starts and a home to live in and hands that work and a job to have and beautiful voices to sing and the baby's giggles and the joys of friendships and the fact that your stomach is full of food or that you have medicine, or that you have what you need, all of those things Christians learn to say, God, you are so kind to us. But something else is equally true. Because God is love, the bad things we experience are never from his cruelty or neglect. This one's a little harder in the moment to swallow. Because yeah, that beautiful sunset or sunrise when the sun hits your face and you've got that cup of coffee, yeah, God is good. And then the bad day comes. And you're wondering why it hurts so much. And the sovereign king seems silent, inactive. Has he not heard our prayers? Has he not listened to what we've asked? Does he not care about me or my family or our needs or whatever that may be? Does he not? And the moment you want to question that, you need to remember this equally important truth. God is love. That means he cannot act in a way that is cruel. It is impossible for him to act in a way that is counter to his character. He cannot be neglectful. Because he is love. I was talking to somebody within the last 10 days who was weeping over the fact that God is not hearing their prayer. God is able to do such and such, this person said. I believe God can do this. Why is God not acting? Why does he not respond? And and this is what I said. We don't know why. He may not respond and answer this particular prayer or meet this particular need. And it was a legitimate need. It wasn't a small thing. But I said, we know based upon his care that it's not because he's cruel. It's not because he's neglecting you in some way. It simply is that we must, in the mystery of that reality, must trust that everything he does still fits under the umbrella of the fact that God is love. And that may not satisfy all those immediate needs or even that guttural feeling of pain, but it is a truth. That second song that the choir led us through speaks those words about God, the, the, the care of Christ, whatever befall, whatever we face, we know he is a gentle guide, and he has been for generations. We just saying that. Life is hard, there is suffering, but we know who our shepherd is, and we trust our shepherd. Now again, that is beautiful, right? When the sun's shining down on me, and the world's the, all the way it should be. That sounds great. Let's sing that one again. But how about on the road marked with suffering? In those moments, you need to grab the railing of 1 John 4. When you doubt or you question or you just simply hurt, you say, I know you are not cruel, God. I know you do not neglect. 
because you are love. A couple other just pastoral exhortations from this truth that when the Bible says God is love, it's explaining everything God does for us, does to us and for us. Because God is love, our suffering is never beyond repair or hope. But we, we just live in a, a, a gluten-free, fat-free, calorie-free, suffering-free culture, don't we? It's on the menu. We choose suffering-free. That's just not reality. The road marked with suffering at some point or another hits all of us. It is a broken creation. It is a broken world. Just, just listening briefly to the news this morning, hearing that since the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, another 300 civilians have died. 300 civilians, not just soldiers, not just cruel Hamas terrorists, civilians. It is a road marked with suffering. And it's not just over in the Middle East, it's, it's all around us. It is a broken creation with bodies decaying, and power and greed, feeling like it runs amok. Because God is love, our suffering is never beyond repair or, or hope. I, I even said some weeks ago now that we need to think between the first creation and the new creation as the first and the second half. And it's only the first half, brothers and sisters. The second half is coming. When God renews all things and all creation is renewed. And the, the fact of that renewal and the power behind that renewal is rooted in the fact that God is love. Last thing, because God is love, because he is benevolent and generous, our joys now, hear this, especially those of you who are suffering, our joys now are only a foretaste of the joys and blessings to come. Like, if you think this is good, it, it, it's just a mere appetizer before the main meal. Like, all those little tastes of the beauty and the goodness and the generosity of God is just beginning. Because we know, 1 John 4, that God is love. But those need to be the spectacles that you and I wear so that we can enjoy the sunrise and feel its warmth and give praise to our God. And we can experience moments of suffering, even long seasons of it, and entrust ourselves to a benevolent and gracious Father who will always and fully, beyond what we can imagine, care for his children even if what we experience now or feel gutterly doesn't quite line up. We trust what we know about our God. And we resign ourselves, submit ourselves to his character. Because to be completely honest and cut to the point, in, in whom will you turn otherwise? Where will you put your trust? If not your creator and savior. Verse 9 gives us a, a, another point, and, and, and really verses 9 and 10 flesh out that statement at the end of verse 8, God is love. And, and I love this. It, it, it does it in verse 9 and then 10 as well. But listen to verse 9. It's like he, John wants to explain how God is love. And he says this, this is how God showed his love among us. Like just so you don't miss it. There's, there's no confusion. And this is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 9 is teaching us how God showed his love among us. I love that language. Not just for you individually. Notice it's corporate. Like it was never just about you as if you were the cul-de-sac where it would stop. It was always about us, God's people. And he sent his son in the flesh in a real and tangible way. Notice how the sending of the son was for, was for what purpose? He sent his one and only son into the world so that what? We might live through him. Not just one part of your life. Not just a better life. 
Not even a problem-free life, an entirely new life. Radical transformation. This is why Advent is so significant. Notice verse 9. The sending of the sun. That is what Advent celebrates. It's like the church knew when it was setting up its calendar to stop every year for, for five weeks to remind God's people in the midst that God loves you. And the reason you know that is because he sent his son into the world for you that you would have life in him. Because he would just know that we get forgetful and we go on our ways and lackadaisical on our purpose and focus and identity. And so the church would stop for five weeks, five Sundays, and remind you, remember the world without Christ? Remember the promise? Remember the coming? Remember the birth? That's God's love. Advent is not a small thing. It's the annual celebration of the love of God for us. But think of the ways Advent easily gets lost in the battle of the cultural Christian season. And there's nothing wrong with a little, I mean, I'm not an eggnog guy, uh, or whatever drinks you might find at Starbucks, or I mean, the decorations, sure. But again, if we're not careful, all of that can distract us from the real reason for the season. Let me give you an example of two songs. Uh, one, one is called Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Let me read you the words. I'm not going to sing it to you just to do no dishonor <laughs> to anyone's ears here. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. From now on, our troubles will be miles away. Notice the escapism. You hear that? <clears throat> Through the years, we will all be together if the fates allow. Isn't it a fate? Not providence. Hang a shining star upon the highest bow and have yourself a merry little Christmas now. It's kind of like somebody just passing you an eggnog in an oncology ward and saying, hey, just ignore it for a minute. There you go. Look at that pretty shining Christmas tree. Escape, denial, problems going away. How about this one? It's the one we're going to sing as we close today. It's called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. There's no escapism in that. That is God's people crying out, saying, we are literally broken, exiled, homeless, wandering, craving God that he would send his son. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Israel. Listen to the, the, the next line. O come thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory o'er the grave. He's talking about that cosmic warfare between Satan and his dominion and the people of God and the Son. It's dealing with the reality of death, that it has no hold over the Christian, so that it can end not with, have yourself a merry little Christmas now, but rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Now, which one does more justice to our plight? From now on, our troubles will be miles away. Pass me some eggnog and let me look at the Christmas tree? Or in a reality of exile in a foreign world, 
with the dominion of Satan having forms of sway over God's creation and death itself running amok in our world. Come, Lord Jesus. Which ones do you hope your children will think of first when life hits them in the face? Eggnog or Easter? God's love is most clearly presented to us in the sending of Jesus to the world. And Advent shouts that truth and forms it in our habits so that we're always thinking of the greatest gift on the eve of Christmas, even if there's still excitement in our little children's bodies for the gift that they'll get that next day. Verse 10 gives us another truth. Notice again how, like verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us, colon, right? Look at verse 10. This is love. Now he defines God's love most clearly. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love is most powerfully experienced by us in the saving work of the cross. In fact, God defines the love of God through the gift of the cross. That is remarkable. A symbol of death and torture is the clearest symbol of God's love. By the way, don't let that mean that the only way God can love you is in good things. Or that only with a life without suffering does God really show you his love. Because it was actually through suffering that the clearest and most pointed example of his love was expressed. But don't even miss that opening statement. Not that we loved God. Have you ever had somebody in your life, don't raise hands or give suggestions, that are hard to love? Maybe hard to like? Maybe just hard to be around? We're not talking about that little baby you get to hold where you would do anything. Maybe three in the morning is a little bit different maybe, but most of the time you just want to pour love into this little child of yours or this little grandbaby or whatever it may be. Like, again, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking the person that just, you wouldn't mind if you never had to talk to again. Think about the difference between you and your Lord. Were you just lovable? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That is one of the most remarkable statements of God's grace in the Bible. God's love was not based on who we were, on what we did, on what we could offer him. It was entirely and only based on his love for us. The only reason God sent his son is because he is love, not because we're lovable. That's why we speak of grace, amazing grace, is that God loved the unlovable, and that's us. And the cross is God's love in action. Not that we loved God, verse 10, but that he loved us, and therefore sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He loved us and sent his son. It wasn't just emotions for him. It was an action. And the cross of Christ was an atoning sacrifice. If you think Christians make too much of the sin problem or make too much of the need for the cross, then you're missing that. Even when God talks about love, it is rooted in the cross. It is rooted in our sin. And what's amazing about this is that his love matched and countered his own wrath against us. Because the same God who was love is holy. His holiness could not stand or left untouched the sinfulness of creation. So God's love matched and countered his own wrath. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. 
I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once blind, but now I see. There is the gospel, brothers and sisters. That is Christianity. We, we, could, we could talk about so many other things in this life and world, but it sure seems fitting. In the start of Advent, that you be reminded that God loves you, personally, by name. Well, we get to where he starts and ends, that, that structure the Bible loves to do. He puts the, that beautiful cream in the middle, but it's surrounded by two nicely tasting cookies. And notice that they both start with dear friends, verse 7 and dear friends, verse 11. He's assuming, and here, here's, here's the gist of it. I wanted to sp- spend most of the time on that the love of God, but he's assuming that those who have been loved by God will be lovers. And he actually spends almost more words on that than anything else. True Christians, this is my summary, true Christians will be transformed by the love of God. Look at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. Every time you see that let us, that's an exhortation. You have the chance now is what it's saying. Like you have tasted ridiculously crazy love. What are you going to do with that? You are being invited now to be a conduit of God's love. Let us love one another. Because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Christian love, that is saying, right? Christian love, or the true love of God in us, can only happen when we have been reborn. Again, notice what the end of verse 7 and then verse 8 says. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. I went to a, our son's first college track meet yesterday. That was fun. And had somebody come up to me and say, are you uh, Jacob Clink's family? I go, yeah, how'd you know? You got to be his dad. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, a nice conversation, and I was thinking about this. I mean, imagine that being the response of God's children. Are, are you son of the Father in heaven? Daughter of King Jesus? Oh, yeah. How'd you know? You got to be his child. You got to be. There's that language in verses 7 and 8. There it is. Let's skip down to 11. Again, remember that structural design? Dear friends, again, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It should just be flowing through us. God's love makes a gracious demand on us to be lovers of others. And finally, verse 12, no one has ever seen God. But if we have love for one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. When I was sitting with that person who was wrestling with why God hasn't responded, I was holding their hand. I unavoidably couldn't stop from my own crying as I'm listening to their plight put my arm around their shoulders and remind them of the love of God. And in that moment, as a fellow child of God and as that person's brother, I am displaying in the flesh what the body of Christ is meant to do, to be loving somebody with God's love. Not because we loved God, but because he loved us and sent his son. So Hope Church, who loves you? Not just your parents, not just your extended family, not just your kids or your grandkids, or brothers or sisters. Who loves you? God loves you. Let's pray. Father, you are such a good God to us. We are not worthy to be recipients. There was no love in us. We had no love for you. In fact, we were jealous of your power and authority and might, and we tried to claim it for ourselves. You had every right in your holiness 
that put us in our place. But because you are love, you took our place. Father, may we grasp in this Advent season the gospel. May we be reminded of your love when things are going well and when we are suffering. May the truth that resounds from Genesis to Revelation that God is love be imprinted upon our way of seeing the world, our way of experiencing brokenness, and as this text would say, the way we relate to one another. Lord, help us to be a church that is a conduit of the love of God through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.